everybody. <laughs> I got you. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing, Omar? All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. You are the smartest, best looking, <laughs> most well rounded people within a 500 mile radius, and I thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, tonight, we have Dr. Mark Barman, a friend of mine, colleague in the Department of Physics and Space Sciences. He's been here since 2000. He's been working on high energy particle physics for 20 some years. He's a little vague on that. I think it's uh, you know, a little bit of a spy. Uh, but uh, he, he uh, really brought high energy particle physics to Florida Tech and he's going to talk about some of the exciting results that have been going on uh, in, in the search for the Higgs boson. And uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wood. I also like to thank you all for showing up uh, Friday evening. Uh, I actually didn't anticipate this kind of crowd, so I certainly appreciate it. And uh, folks, let me start by saying that uh, we live in amazing times. And trust me, I'm not talking about presidential elections. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we, I believe, we will be looking at major discoveries, major breakthroughs in our understanding of nature within the next uh, few years or perhaps next decade. And some mysteries of nature that people have been trying to understand uh, would be solved. One of which is, of course, the origin of mass, uh, which is the topic of uh, my lecture today, or tonight, I should say. Um, what you see on this slide, uh, of course, the outline of the talk, which uh, I'm going to start with telling you what the mass is all about, and uh, then review what we call the standard model of particle physics. Like any major science, branch of science, uh, particle physics also has what's called a standard model, which is basically our understanding of how that particular science works. So I'm going to review this in you know, one or two slides, so it would be a, obviously a very short review. Then I uh, move on to the uh, um, topic of search for the Higgs boson. And of course, we'll talk about what it is and how we search for it, and eventually come to my conclusions from the latest measurements that we have done at CERN. Uh, this uh, view graph here actually shows you a real collision of protons at uh, 70 EV center of mass energy. And what you can actually perhaps see, uh, these are tracks of charged particles emerging from this collision. And uh, as they traverse the detectors, they leave their footprints. For example, these towers indicate to you uh, energy deposited in the detectors. And these, uh, these green lines, crossing green lines, actually tell you that a charged particle all made it all the way to the outer detectors. And these are very likely muons. So uh, this is the kind of thing that we create in these collisions. And then we have to try to understand whether these collisions uh, can be described by the so-called standard model of particle physics. So that's the basic idea. Mass. Uh, one can look at this in uh, two levels, macro level. Ordinary objects, uh, everyday objects, uh, we have uh, two masses that we talk about, inertial mass and gravitational mass. Inertial mass, which is like uh, if I were to push this desk here, I feel a resistance. Uh, so that we could actually refer to it as the mass of this object. It's uh, given in terms of uh, the ratio of the force exerted on the object over uh, the resulting acceleration. <clears throat> Gravitational mass is similar in the sense that uh, it's also a ratio of 
Now this time the weight of the object over the gravitational acceleration. These are similar concepts and in fact uh, through principle of equivalence we say that they must be in fact equal. People have tested this. In fact back in the 17th century Newton showed that these are equal uh, to one part in a thousand. And of course uh, as we have uh, done this uh, with more precision uh, the latest result that I have, uh, it says that the two masses are indeed the same, uh, one part in 10 to the 16th. Then Einstein, of course, came along and eventually required the equivalence of these two in his general theory of relativity. <clears throat> now, the other level, which is, of course, really relevant to what I'm talking about tonight, is the macro level or subatomic level. Of course the idea is that <clears throat> if you understand mass at this level and everything is made of these subatomic particles then of course eventually you would understand mass at this larger macro level. So we need to really look here and see if we could explain the concept of mass at this level first. However here mass is a bit of a mystery and as such we actually consider it as a fundamental property of the particles. I, I trust everybody knows what an electron is and we have made a measurement of its mass in many many experiments that we have done many many measurements and in fact we can actually distinguish this from other particles by its mass so it becomes a property of that particle. We could use it to distinguish it and in fact eventually classify the particles at subatomic level. Um, <clears throat> another particle that everyone is uh, familiar with is proton and here's the mass of the proton. We have these funny units but if you want in more uh, standard units in kilograms this is about 1 times 10 to the thir minus 30 for the electron and the proton of course is about 1700 times more massive. This question of why this is so ma more, much more massive than this is also another interesting question that we need to address eventually. <clears throat> but the point though is that these masses are measured in experiments. Our theoretical frame work does not have anything to say about what these masses should be. Indeed, from the measurements, we use these numbers as input to our theory. So the origin of where this mass comes from is unknown. And that's really the point that we're trying to understand now. Where elementary particles acquire their masses from. <clears throat> Now, um, as I said, I'm going to be very brief on what we call the standard model of particle physics, just so that, uh, uh, you know, essentially you know what I'm talking about on my later slides. Uh, there is much more to this than this one slide that I have, which I trust if people are interested. The beauty of the web these days is that uh, all you have to do is search for something and you'll, you'll see tons of material on it. Um, we do really consider this uh, an achievement, in fact a major achievement of 20th century because uh, it really has combined some of the most fundamental theoretical understanding of how nature works as well as a lot of measurements that we have done in our laboratories to formulate this uh, so-called standard model of particle physics. It has taken us uh, almost 80 or so many years to, to get to where we are now. The picture which actually emerges is amazingly simple. It's just right here on this slide. At the most fundamental level that we know of now, we have what we call matter particles. These are classified into two categories of leptons, 
electron that I just mentioned to you is an example of it. Muon and the tau leptons are in many ways behaving like electrons except that they are more massive. And then we have the corresponding neutrinos, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and these six particles plus their corresponding antiparticles form what we call leptons. Compared to what we have up here, which we call quarks, they have funny names, up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom, or if you are in Europe, a lot of times we call this the truth and we call this the beauty. These names are actually somewhat historical. Obviously, they don't refer to any fundamental property of these particles. Um, people who discovered them or first talked about them came up with these interesting names. Um, these particles, again, have their own corresponding antiparticles. And just to give you an example, the proton that I mentioned before is formed by putting two of these up quarks and one of these down quarks into a composite structure, combine them, and that forms a proton. <clears throat> and there are many other particles that I could mention, but again, uh, in the interest of time, let me move on. The major difference between these two is that these guys strongly interact with each other, whereas these guys do not. They have only electromagnetic and weak interactions. And speaking of interactions, that brings us to what we call force particles here. These are W and Z bosons, photon that we, of course, we all know, and what we call gluons. These particles, actually, they, they are the um, mediators of the forces or the interactions of these, these particles. And as you perhaps uh, remember, there are uh, four fundamental forces in nature. All other forces are some manifestation of those four. There is, the, of course, gravity, the oldest one that we know of in terms of our investigation of it. Then there is, of course, electricity and magnetism or electromagnetic force. That's basically driven by, these, uh, by the photon and the weak force, which, which is like uh, now, of course, in a more unified picture, we talk about electroweak forces. These are mediated by these bosons here. Then we have the strong force. Strong force, the uh, best example where you could see it is, again, how we actually put these quarks together to form a proton. The force that holds that combination together is called a strong force, and its uh, quantum or mediator is this uh, gluon here. <clears throat> so as I said, what you see here is really the basis for all matter that we see in universe, at least the visible part of it. And what's not actually um, completely understood is, um, is the fact that these particles have different masses. And where that mass comes from, we don't really know. We have an idea, and that's what we want to actually talk about today in terms of testing that idea. But that's, um, that's the mystery that we still have to uh, somehow resolve. By the way, this standard model of particle physics has been tested to super high precision in recent measurements that we have done in the last, well, I wouldn't say recent, but in the last 30 years or so. And it's been very successful in explaining all the measurements. So we really trust it. However, um, and if I have time at the end of my, my talk, maybe I mention a few things about that, the fact that um, it's not complete, though. It's not the complete picture. But coming back to, to uh, mass, the idea is to have a mechanism which gives masses to these things, and we call it the Higgs mechanism. This Higgs mechanism, before I leave this, by the way, um, whatever we have in here does not have an explanation of gravity. Gravity is something that is 
difficult to handle at quantum level, and we do not yet have a good quantum theory of gravity. Uh, so that we're going to leave that aside. Uh, this standard model of particle physics only deals with the three forces that I mentioned, um, electricity, magnetism, weak, and strong forces. By the way, uh, speaking of um, Higgs, <laughs> this is actually a funny uh, title for this. We are searching for Higgs, but <laughs> there's the man. <laughs> this is uh, Peter Higgs, a, a British uh, theoretician, a theoretical physicist, um, still active, still uh, uh, participating, and uh, and he was the one who came up, actually he's, he wasn't really the only one, quite a few people worked on this, but he was the one who really got the most recognition for presenting this idea of Higgs mechanism. And of course, the, uh, the, the name comes from him. By the way, in background you see parts of our detector, which I talk about a little bit later. Now what is this Higgs mechanism? <clears throat> in a very... Um, let me put it this way, simple picture. One could describe this as a field, just like we have electromagnetic field, uh, which <clears throat> permeates the space around us. There's a field that uh, we, of course, name it Higgs field, uh, which fills up the space around us, everywhere in the universe. Now, in quantum field theory, the foundation of our theoretical formulation of all this, fields have particles or quantum associated with them. And in this case, uh, we call that quantum the Higgs boson. So that's actually where the Higgs boson comes from. It's the particle associated with the Higgs field. <clears throat> and again, perhaps uh, most of you are familiar with the fact that, for example, in electricity and magnetism, elec the, the field has a quantum, which of course is the photon. Now, as other particles are swimming in this field all around us, if they interact with this Higgs boson, that interaction results in a mass for that particle. The example that I use to kind of describe what's happening here is um, a simple one. If you take a cup, fill it with water, and then take a teaspoon and stir it. Of course, you feel some resistance as you actually stir, but not much. Now, suppose you fill the cup with honey, and then try to stir it. Then you see that the teaspoon is not moving as readily as it used to be in, in water. One way to interpret that is to say, hey, the teaspoon all of a sudden became more massive. It acquired mass. And the way it acquired it was because it interacted with this field, which in this simple example is the honey in the cup. So as these particles swim through the Higgs field, by their interaction, they become more massive. That's the real simple picture that one could actually uh, present in terms of giving you a feel what we're talking about here. This point here is a bit technical and I'm, I'm not going to bother with it. But what's, uh, what's interesting about all of this uh, theory is that um, as much as we're talking about the mass, the theory itself does not have much to say about the mass of the Higgs boson itself it becomes an unknown and a parameter of the theory, which we need to somehow discover or somehow determine. And this, of course, um, makes our lives uh, very difficult because if we knew what the Higgs boson mass was or we had a prediction from theory, then we could design an experiment much simpler than what we have done and focusing to finding that particular object with the mass that we anticipate from the theory. Much like we did, for example, for W and Z bosons, because the theory had a prediction for their masses, 
the experiments UA1 and UA2 back, back, into, back in the 90, uh, early uh, 90s, they discovered them and, and it was simple. But here, the picture is more complicated because this particular Higgs boson, we do not know its mass. And we have to design our experiment and search for all possible masses that it can have, well, except that we know that there are some upper limits on it from some um, theoretical limitations that we have on the theory. So the mass is unknown, and as such, we need to um, look at everything as a function of the mass of this Higgs boson. <clears throat> so for example, how do we produce this particle? Well, I don't want to go into details of these. Uh, these are different mechanisms for production of this Higgs boson. Theory is very good about how you actually um, produce and, in fact, measure the rate of its production, which is something that we call the cross-section for, for the particle, for its production, this, uh, this sigma here. It's essentially how often you actually produce this particle. And the plot that I'm showing is actually the production cross-section for the Higgs boson based on these mechanisms. You know, they're color-coded in here as a function of the mass of the Higgs boson. As I said, Higgs boson mass is unknown, so as such you have to do these calculations for all possible masses that it can have. <clears throat> of course, these are for collisions at 7 TeV energy, which is what we have at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and I have more to say about this uh, in a few slides. <clears throat> And just to give you a feel, again, for what this no these numbers mean, if you assume that your Higgs boson has a mass of 120 GeV. Now, uh, some of you probably don't recognize this particular unit for mass, but this really comes from equivalence of mass and energy as, uh, as we say in E equal mc square, Einstein's formulation of relationship between mass and energy. And as such, this actually is given a, a unit, which is the unit we use for energy. But <clears throat> in these units, we assume that the um, velocity of light, C, is equal to 1. So as such, energy and mass have the same units. But anyway. It's not a big deal. The point is that if we say that the particle has 120 GeV in mass, <clears throat> at this particular accelerator with this intensity, you would actually produce one every 10 seconds. Now keep that number in mind, and we come back to this uh, um, later on. Now once you have produced this Higgs boson, then what happens to it? These are unstable particles. They decay. They don't hang around too much for too long. So what you need to do is to figure what they might actually decay into. And again, theory is very good about telling you what they could decay into. And that's actually presented in this relatively complicated plot, again, as a function of the mass of the unknown uh, mass of the Higgs boson. So these are so-called branching fractions. You could see that the Higgs boson could decay into a pair of B quarks, a pair of top quarks, charm quarks, gluons, photons. Pair, and as, as the mass goes up, it could, of course, decay into more massive objects like WW or Z and Z. Sorry, this is tau. Actually, T over, is over here. So um, we know all of this. The theory has given these predictions as to what it could decay into. And in fact, we use this feature to develop a strategy for searching for it. And that strategy actually is, is made of three regions of mass. Um, we consider low mass, like in this region here, in the neighborhood of about 100 GeV. Uh, and in that case, uh, the two 
most sensitive um, channels, if you like, decay channels for the Higgs, are the BB bar and the photons down here. Um, this is a very clean channel, as I talk about later on. However, as you can see, the branching ratio is very small. This has a huge branching ratio, but it's a very dirty channel. It's very difficult to decipher the decay of the Higgs into this from all the other things that could actually um, become a background, as we say, or resemble this type of decay. Then we consider an intermediate mass range, which is like in this neighborhood here. There, of course, these are the, uh, the two decay modes most likely for the Higgs to go into. And as such, our strategy is to focus on searching for these type of um, decay modes. This is in particular interesting because Z boson has very interesting decay modes itself. So it, the Higgs decays into a pair of Zs. Then each of these could decay into a pair of, for example, electrons. So your event, if you have produced the Higgs, would be a rather quiet event with four very energetic electrons in it. It's a beautiful signature, if you like, as we say, for, for the Higgs boson. And then finally, we have a high mass uh, region which is like in this range of uh, all the way up to 800 GeV or so. And there, again, we could concentrate on Zs because Higgs would decay mostly into these Zs. <clears throat> well, anyway, so the bottom line is that we do have a, a strategy to look for this even though we do not know its mass. But it's a complicated story. Now, how do we actually look for these things? And that's where particle accelerators come into action. And I wanted to say just a few words about how particle accelerators have really helped our sciences to make progress and to really learn about nature. So much we owe to particle accelerators. Um, <clears throat> essentially, starting in about 1950s, it was then that people really developed the technologies to put particle accelerators together and be able to produce um, collisions of particles to allow to look at various things. For example, um, one could actually look inside nature into smaller and smaller sizes for using very high energy beams, which uh, thanks to Professor De Bry, we know that the energy or momentum goes as one over the size that you can explore. So the higher the energy, the smaller objects you could actually explore. And this becomes our microscope, so to speak. So particle accelerators could be looked at as very powerful microscopes. Next, again, through this uh, equation, due to Einstein of equivalence of mass and energy, if you produce high collisions, high energy collisions, naturally you could actually, some of that energy could actually be transformed into mass of new particles, and as such allow us to discover new particles with high mass. In fact, that's essentially what we're trying to do with the Higgs boson. And then finally, it also allows us these Particle accelerators allow us to kind of look back in time and look at conditions in early universe because high energy also means high temperatures and high densities and as such uh, with higher and higher particle accelerator energies we could really recreate those conditions of early universe and study them. So in a nutshell, you know, observing and measuring phenomena which are not observable in everyday experience are made possible thanks to particle accelerators. An example of these particle accelerators that, of course, we are using currently is the so-called Large Hadron Collider. In this uh, view graph, you see actually um, how this is situated uh, or located in uh, uh, 
near the border to, uh, in, in Switzerland and France. This is, if you could see, this is Lake Geneva here. And these are the Jura Mountains right over here. Um, currently, this is the most powerful particle accelerator. It's 27 kilometers round, and it's, of course, underground, about 100 meters underground. And inside the tunnel right here looks kind of like this. What you see is um, a string or a train of um, electromagnets, which, of course, uh, uh, allow us to inject protons in them and then these protons will be traveling with higher and higher speeds and eventually uh, coming to practically speed of light and as such becoming um, very energetic. And then by mastery of the people who uh, run these accelerators, they could actually bring these protons <coughs> to collide at the center of our detectors. In fact, in this uh, picture, you can see that there are two rings, like we have the blue ring, which carries bunches of protons uh, counterclockwise. And then we have the red ring, which carries them in clockwise fashion. And then you bring them together in collisions, say, at this point here. These bunches have a lot of protons in them, in fact, about 10 to the 11. The current beam energy, as we said, it's uh, <clears throat> this, in other words, for the collisions, it's 70 EV. Luminosity is a number which really tells you something about the intensity of the beam. And these crossings are happening at 40 megahertz. <clears throat> so there are that many collisions, actually, between these protons, something about like uh, a billion collisions per second. <clears throat> and that's as such how we produce the collisions, and I showed you a picture in the very beginning. Now, <clears throat> this is an aerial photograph of where CERN is located. Uh, in fact, again, you can see Lake Geneva over here. This, of course, is where the ring is, but underground. And you can see a lot of farmland and, of course, uh, some towns and... and uh, perhaps you could also see the, uh, uh, where is the airport here? I, I lose it now. Oh, there it is. This is the airport right here. <clears throat> now, the experiments which are looking at these collisions produced by LHC, the two experiments, the two large, what we call general purpose experiments, are ATLAS and CMS. Uh, we are actually, Florida Tech is a, a member institution in, in this experiment. Again, I'll say more about this. This is the sister experiment. And um, then we have two other experiments also looking at collisions of these protons. The, sometimes in the, in the state of protons, they actually put heavy ions inside these beams. And as such, then you look at the heavy ion collisions. Uh, this experiment, Alice, is actually a dedicated experiment to study heavy and ion collisions. And then we have the um, <clears throat> LHCb, which is actually um, a dedicated experiment to look at yet another mystery of our uh, universe. And that is why everything is made of matter and not antimatter, and what happened to antimatter. Um, just to give you again an idea of the complexity of all of this, let me just mention one measure, and that is how much data that would we, one would have to actually handle from all these experiments. Um, each year, we're talking about 15 million gigabytes of data recorded by these experiments. And uh, somebody, I don't know how they managed to do this, but somebody figured that uh, this is actually uh, something about one and a half times the height of Mount Everest if you put it all CDs. <laughs> all right. The experiment that we are a member of, the compact muon solenoid, and that's what this uh, CMS stands for, 
Uh, it's a large co collaboration, and let me tell you a little bit about uh, the sociology of it. Um, there are about 3,400 uh, 3, scientists and engineers working on this experiment. Um, and speaking of students, there are about 800 students actually doing work. And you can imagine they are working very hard to get their PhD dissertations done using data from these experiments. This actually, this is not uh, the entire CMS. This is maybe about a quarter of the people that they managed to get together at one time to take this photo. Uh, and this is at the experimental hall. Or the compact muon solenoid detector is underneath these folks. <clears throat> this is actually a picture from looking from the top on it when it was opened. It's not closed yet. And this is back actually in a few years back. Um, 170 institutes from 40 countries. So you can imagine this is a very large effort and because of that, it is an international effort. No one country could actually afford bringing so many intellectual as well as financial resources to do these, these experiments. Um, it so happens, by the way, that the US is actually the largest national group with about 50 <coughs> universities and institutes involved in this experiment. Now, speaking of the detector, um, it's challenging to put such a detector together because of some of the parameters that we just talked about. We have one billion proton-proton interactions per second. And you need to figure what are the interesting interactions, write them on tape, and of course, forget about the rest. But in order to record all of these interactions before you make that decision, you need a lot of channels, electronic channels, eyes looking at what's happening in your detector. This detector has about 100 million electronics channels looking at data pouring in. And every second, we actually have to handle about 40 terabytes of data in order, again, to make decisions as to whether the collisions are interesting and there's something that we want to go back and study or whether they are useless and we let them go. Obviously, we are dealing in a very high radiation area where this detector sits. So all these detectors have to be radiation tolerant or at, le at least tolerant or perhaps radiation hard. And that makes it also very challenging. Um, I don't want to really go into too much details of this because it would take too much time. But let's just say that the detector is, has three basic uh, elements an inner detector which looks at charge particles, so it's a tracking device, silicon tracker. Then we have calorimetry, which uh, is made of two parts, calorimetry for looking at uh, electromagnetic deposition as well as hadronic deposition, energy deposition. And then we have an outer set of detectors which looks for muons. This is a large detector. In fact, you can kind of judge. This is an exploded view, by the way. Um, this, is, this is a typical human being here. In fact, on next slide, I show you, again, a picture of the detector as it was assembled underground. This is a five-story building underground. You can actually see from the floors here. This is actually uh, a gigantic uh, detector with, uh, with uh, these many elements here, and you can see all the cables and all sorts of stuff that uh, obviously uh, we don't want to go into details. But it's, it's really it's amazing that for looking for the smallest thing in the world, you need such gigantic detectors to look for them. <laughs> all right. On to our search for the so-called Higgs boson. Before LHC started to take data, of course, people have been looking for this. In fact, you notice from my first slide, I said 40-year quest for, um, uh, for the Higgs boson. So it's been going on for a long time. It's not something that we just started. And let me just uh, briefly mention the results of some of the searches that we had done uh, before LHC. Um, with two accelerators, one which was called LEP, again located at CERN in Europe, and Tevatron, which uh, 
which is uh, located in chi near Chicago. Uh, people looked, they had, uh, of course they didn't find it, and they came up with limits on the mass of this object. And these are the limits stated here. In a nutshell, uh, the mass, and this is the more important actually um, measurement, the mass is larger than about 114 GeV. These guys managed to exclude any Higgs boson with a smaller mass than that. That could not exist. Otherwise, they would have found it. And Tevatron actually has uh, these ranges, which they say they, the object could still exist. And they excluded this particular range um, from, <clears throat> say, about 156 to about 176. Uh, this is a complicated plot, and I will discuss this in detail when I get to our results from LHC. So for the moment, just uh, um, let's, uh, let's just stick with these numbers. So these are the, some of the limits that we have on the existence of this object and, and possible masses that it could have. There is actually another approach that you could take in trying to figure out whether the object exists or not, and that is to compile all measurements that we have from other particles, in particular Ws and Zs, look for indirect effects that the Higgs could have in their properties, and then work backwards to see what possible masses the Higgs boson would, could, could, could have before affecting those properties. And from that approach, people have actually managed to also find limits on the Higgs boson mass. And generally, again, these limits, which are, by the way, given at 95%, as we say, confidence level, what that tells you basically is that there is a 5% chance that this particular limit can be violated and be different. Uh, 95 percent certainty, this is the limit that we have derived. So um, as you can see, the masses are supposed to be smaller than about 150 GeV or so. So these so-called precision electroweak measurements tend to prefer a low mass Higgs boson. We do care about this sort of thing because before we discovered the top quark, we actually did the same exercise. And amazingly enough, that exercise with the top quark from these precision electroweak measurements led us to a, an expectation for the top quark mass before it was discovered, which actually turned out to be very close to the actual number when we discovered it. So we trust that this is a good approach to look at this, uh, this, uh, um, this problem. So anyway, this, this actually, I emphasize it with red because this told us although we do not know the mass and we need to look for the whole range, there seems to be some preference for a low mass region for the Higgs. Um, and, and we did actually focus on that as I will show you. Okay. Now how do we, um, how do we uh, go about this search again? Well, obviously, we had to operate the accelerator, and the detectors were collecting data. Um, this is the amount of data that was actually delivered in 2011. Again, these are funny units that I'm not going to actually go into details. Suffice to say that for this funny unit of inverse Femtobarn, these are expectations for the number of Higgs that you might actually see. Um, if the mass is 120 GeV, and we consider, for example, the decay mode where the Higgs goes into a pair of Z bosons, and in turn they decay into four electrons or four muons, the number that you would expect in only one inverse femtobarn is about one and a half. Of course, remember that these are statistical uh, numbers, so you know, number of events, of course, is supposed to be a whole number, but when you do these estimations, you actually get uh, numbers of this nature. Um, 
we collected about uh, five inverse femtobarns. So what we expect for this particular case that I just mentioned is like five times one and a half number of Higgs bosons in our data. So as you can see, these are not very large numbers that we're dealing with. At the end, the game becomes a, a, a game of a statistical, uh, low statistics uh, data sets that we have to work with. Now this is a busy slide, but let me uh, uh, really draw your attention to this table right here. Um, there are eight possible decay modes that the experiment really concentrated on. And these are good for each good for a particular range of mass. So for example, the Higgs into two photons is a good place to look for the Higgs if the mass is between 110 to 150 and so on, so you could see. So at the end, people actually devised selections and careful analyses based on these eight different decay modes that we can consider. Three of these actually are the most sensitive ones, which I have illustrated here, and I'm going to actually show you an example of this one just to give you a feel for the kind of analysis that people have to do. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to skip that slide. I mean, that part of this slide. Here is actually a, a real collision where four muons have been produced. Of course, the way we interpret this is to say that the Higgs decayed into a pair of Z bosons, and each of those decayed into a pair of muons. As you can see, the, the event is quite quiet, as we say. There isn't really much activity. There are obviously some other tracks. Remember, these are protons smashing against each other, so they produce a shower of particles. But in here, what we see is that most of the energy has gone into production of the Zs. We, of course, we think perhaps this is the Zs produced by, by the decay of the Higgs. We are not certain, of course. And as such, then, those Zs have decayed and relieved their energies as these muons. This is a zoom in of the, this area right here where the interaction or the collision happened. You can see all the different tracks. And what's interesting is that these four muons come from the same point, which is very important, of course. So obviously, we could say that they are from the same particle decaying into these four muons. Now, this details some of the what we call selection cuts that one does on these type of events. Again, remember, we are not looking at this event by event. We do on a statistical analysis. So you look for your events of this type in your data. And the way you actually select them is by imposing such selection requirements. Again, I'm not going to really bother going into details because um, at this point, it, it's not really interesting. What's interesting is that at the end, when we have analyzed all our data, we find 13 events which have this type of uh, final state or these, these events have the, the type of um, decay that we considered for Higgs going to ZZ and then ZZ going into four leptons. This is actually a uh, distribution of their masses. These are the events. In fact, if you like, this is a histogram of the masses of these events. Again, not much statistics, only 13 events. And uh, if we do our simulations of what this should be, given our data, we actually expect about nine and a half events from all the other uh, standard model processes that could um, imitate this type of decay. And those are actually given here in terms of these shaded areas. And the expectation for two Higgs boson masses are actually also given on this just to see where you would expect to see populations of events if, for example, the Higgs had a mass of 140 GeV. 
this would be right here. If it were 120, you would see a certain population of events over here. But what's clear is that with these few events, it's very hard to tell whether there is anything actually in terms of a certain region of mass being populated. But then we turn on our sophisticated the statistical uh, analysis of all of this. And as I promised, I'm going to tell you now what this plot um, uh, tells you. This actually, uh, the fact that we haven't really seen any excessive events in this um, particular decay mode can be turned into a limit, in fact an upper limit, on the production rate of the Higgs. Again, remember the production rate, we call it the cross section. So what's actually been plotted on this axis here is the limit at 95% confidence level on that production cross section as derived from our data. And given that we didn't want to actually look at funny numbers here because these cross sections are really given in very funny units, we normalize this number by the expected standard model cross-section. So if in fact this number is equal to a standard model cross-section, then you would get one, which is actually this red line going across. And of course you do this as a function of all the masses that you consider for this particular decay mode. Now what happens is that and I want to draw your attention to this solid black line here. Whenever this solid black line falls below one, that means that the upper limit on the production cross-section is lower than what you would expect from the standard model Higgs boson. Which in turn tells you that, well, in other words, for that, that range of masses, there is no such a Higgs in our data so we can exclude those masses. And that's this shaded area right here. So you see, this is where the line actually drops below one, and that corresponds to 134 GeV, and it goes all the way to just about 158 before it crosses over to above one again. So this range of masses are excluded now because the upper limit on the production is already below the standard model expectation. If you look at this but in a bigger range of masses, you could see actually that there are other areas that the same thing happens. The solid line has fallen below one and as such we can exclude those ranges and these are the ranges as we have shown here. Now remember this is only for this particular decay mode. One can do the same exercise for all the different eight modes that I mentioned, and that's what we did. And then, of course, eventually you can combine all of these. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to, I was, this is actually another interesting decay mode, but um, let me skip to when we actually combine everything. In fact, in this, uh, you could see, in this plot, you could see all the different modes. Uh, all of these messy lines that you can see are those 95% uh, confidence le level limits that we have derived from the individual modes that we considered. But once combined, this is the story. Now. This is the final result. And I'm showing it from all the way from 100 GeV to all the way to 600 GeV. Again, the critical thing that you need to look at is how this solid black line behaves with respect to this uh, red line indicating one. And any time that falls below one, we could say that the standard model Higgs is excluded by our data. And in fact, that turns out to be from 127 all the way to 600 GeV. This entire range is now excluded from, uh, for uh, the standard model Higgs. However, 
Let me zoom in into, in fact, perhaps you notice, this 127, which is right here, we see some interesting stuff happening here. Let's zoom into, the, into this region. So now we're looking at this region of about 110 to 160 GeV. And what you see now is that that solid black line now has actually gone over one, and in fact, in this particular range, has even gone over the expected range of all excursion that we can have for our 95% um, uh, confidence level. The interpretation is that, aha, uh -huh, maybe, maybe something is happening here. Maybe we have an axis of event over, events over our so-called uh, background events in this region. <clears throat> so for this reason, actually, this is the reason why, first of all, we could not say anything about below 127. And people, of course, got very excited for obvious reasons about potentially having a Higgs boson in this region. So then we had to study that in more detail. Now, one way you could actually ask yourself, and this is now getting into a little bit of a statistical analysis, which is really beyond this lecture that I'm giving here. Um, suffice to say that one of the parameters that you could look at, one of the quantities that you look at in terms of whether your backgrounds can fluctuate and imitate a signal in, in your data is what's called p-value which is like the probability for a background to look, fluctuate and look like a signal. The idea is that if these p-values, the smaller they are, the less likely that data describes, the, uh, the data are, descri are described by background fluctuations. So now, of course, we calculate these p-values for this range of 110 to 160. And this is what they look like. For the most part in these areas, they seem to be actually large enough that we could say that <clears throat> any of these fluctuations are due to fluctuations of background. In this particular region here, it gets interesting. The p-values are small enough that one could say that perhaps there is actually a little bit of signal in this area. Furthermore, you could actually go and look at the best fit value for this sigma uh, that, that, uh, that limit that we have actually uh, derived and see how that best fit tells you something about whether the, the, as a function of the Higgs boson mass, whether they approach this value of one or not. And this is the resulting plot. And as you can see, there is actually a, a crossing of this best fit at about 124 with this red line where sigma over sigma stand, uh, the model is, is equal to 1. So <clears throat> the, the bottom line here is that this best fit is touching the sigma over sigma standard model equal 1 at, this, at a mass of about 124, which one could, again, uh, use as an indication of if there is a Higgs boson, it should be about this, this, this mass. We cannot obviously be sure because significance, the statistical significance of these p-values is not good enough to be absolutely sure. And that is indicated by the fact that this is just about two sigma away from one, whereas if you wanted to really be sure that p-values are really telling you that your data cannot be described by background fluctuation, you want this to be perhaps three or maybe even four sigma away from one. Like in the standard in our industry is actually that you want these to be minimum three sigma but prefer to have five sigma or four sigma away from the nominal number. And that doesn't seem to be, of course, the case. Nevertheless, there is some 
tantalizing hints that maybe something is happening here. So with that said, let me actually go on to my conclusions. <clears throat> the, the CMS experiment has ruled out at 95% certainty this range of masses for the Higgs boson, 127 to 600 GeV. And the sister experiment, ATLAS, actually has found more or less similar results. We are unable to exclude presence of the Higgs boson below 127 GeV. And that has to do with the fact that there seems to be an excessive event, and as such, this uh, prevents us from really excluding that area. However, that excess, <clears throat> which is, seems to be most compatible with 124 GeV, is not really significant enough, statistically speaking, to really be conclusive. We could really have such excesses due to fluctuations of our background. So we cannot rule that out. And of course, what's going to happen next is we're getting ready to collect data again. In fact, in about a month, we start taking data. The center of mass energy of the accelerator is going to go up to 8 TV, which helps us a lot because now the production cross sections are going to be larger. So we have larger, uh, potentially larger number of Higgs produced. And obviously, uh, with data that we collect, which would be probably two or three times minimum, I would say, larger than the data set that we had in 2011, we should be able to definitely discover or rule out a standard model Higgs boson. So that actually takes me to this slide, <laughs> which these fellows have actually seen the tip of it. And they say, depending on how far it goes, it could be the discovery of the century. And uh, let me close by my pitch for basic sciences. I always do this when I give a lecture in, in such settings here. Um, the obvious question for people who are not physicists is, or maybe even some physicists, well, who cares? if you have a Higgs boson and who cares if the mass of it is 140 or 50 or 20, what do we care? How does it relate to everyday life? Or how does it relate to something that I do, especially when people consider all the resources that go into um, putting these experiments together, taking data, analyzing it. These are very expensive enterprises HC cost upwards of 10 billion Swiss, uh, not Swiss, yeah, Swiss francs actually, so even more than uh, dollars these days. And our detector alone cost more than half a million dollars. So, um, uh, half a billion, I should say. So, so as such, you, you rightfully one could ask, what's the benefit of all this? And the first answer that I normally give is that, well, you know, as we know from the two examples that I have put on this slide, and there are many examples, many more, basic sciences always lead to technological advances that benefit all mankind. You know, you can only consider what would happen if you didn't have relativity. I mean, every, just about everybody has a GPS on your cell phone, in your car, or everywhere. Without knowing relativity, this wouldn't work. Or your cell phones, which you all have these days, you know that it wouldn't work without knowing how uh, electricity and magnetism work. So thanks to these, uh, um, these gentlemen here, who, when they worked on these, they didn't really have a clue. I can, I'm, I can imagine that Maxwell had no idea that one day what he was working on would lead to putting together a device like a cell phone. No way. But that's what, of course, happened. It, of course, it takes a long time, but eventually it comes. So these are examples of doing basic research, which eventually pays off and makes life easier for all mankind. Now, the second um, answer that I have, which I feel actually very strongly uh, about, is the fact that it satisfies our intellectual curiosity. I mean, this is part of our 
nature, I mean, uh, human nature, we are always curious about wanting to know what's happening around us and, and can we explain the nature around us. So to that end, and in this particular case, what is mass and why is this mass here? Can we understand this and learn something? So that's, that's another reason why I think we should support basic research. And my request to you is that, you know, especially these days, politicians talk about cutting taxes and this and that. And at the end of the day, one of the victims is always basic research. So if you have a chance to support funding of basic research, please do, because it's good for all of us, actually. So I thank you, and I take some questions if you have any questions.